Alrighty, welcome everybody. We are at Midwest Gaming Classic 2024, and back on the stage with us is Matt Benzik with Benzik Designs and Nudge Magazine. It's a Nudge <laughs> Magazine yeah. photographer, y'all, if you didn't know. And he's going to show us some awesome techniques on how to use skeleton game software to code a pinball machine. Awesome, yeah. Um, so originally I had some uh, slides to, to talk about, you know, what is skeleton game, who am I, and why should you listen to me when it comes to software? And I was going to call this, uh, this um, seminar How to Code a Pinball Machine for People That Don't Know How to Code. And um, that's frankly who I am. So my name again is Matt Benzik. Uh, I'm from the Detroit area. I'm a pinballer. I am also a homebrew designer. Uh, I got into uh, pinball about seven years ago, and about six years ago, started thinking I want to design my own pinball machine. And you know, when I started that process, you know, I, I had a cool idea you know, what I wanted the machine to be, what I wanted the machine to do. And then eventually it got to the point where I needed to actually build the thing and not only build the thing, but make it do the things I wanted to do. Now, when you're designing a homebrew pinball machine, there's a couple decisions you have to make in that process. The first is, how are you going to control it? Uh, what board set are you going to use? There's a couple uh, kind of industry standard board sets that guys use. Uh, there's boards by Multimorphic and there's boards by Fast Pinball. Both are very capable and uh, robust boards and systems. They basically do the same thing in different ways, and their different ways make them uh, more useful or you know easier to get into, depending on you know your skill set and what you're trying to do. I personally selected the P3 system. Um, I selected that frankly because I had more friends running the P3. And so my friends that were running that, that board set said, hey, if you have a problem, I've probably hit that problem and I can walk you through it. Um, you know, I didn't have any friends near me running fast. I didn't have any friends near me running MPF. So that's the first decision. What board set are you using? The second decision is what framework are you using the software, the, 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 the pin, the code that takes your ideas and tells the display, the speakers, the lights, the switches, and all of the coils, how to take all of that, you know, turn it into like deep level machine code and, you know, turn it into action. At that decision, there are two main frameworks. There is skeleton grain framework that is built off of a um, a software called Pyproc Game, uh, built by Adam Priel and Jerry Sellenberg. Um, and uh, so Skeleton, so Pyproc Game is how the computer talks to the boards. Skeleton Game runs on top of that Pyproc Game to handle the displays, to handle the sound, to handle you know, all of the things that you know make the game pretty, and also handle ball control, ball count, player count, all of that. The other, the other software is the Mission Pinball Framework. Uh, Mission Pinball Framework is a fantastic uh, uh, software suite. Um, it is more kind of. It's kind of the easier way to get into software uh, for pinball because it's all configuration files. Um, a lot of the hard work is done behind the scenes. So if you're just trying to get going for the first time, Mission Pinball Framework is a really great way to get into that. Where it becomes harder is when you want to do things that Mission Pinball Framework doesn't have baked in. When you have to do things outside of that, it gets much harder and you have to learn how to code. St Skeleton Game, which is the system that I selected, is much more writing code. Uh, it is uh, essentially an event handler system. And what the code breaks down to is, is in Skeleton Game, you have all of your switches, all of your coils. Everything is based off switch rules. So you'll have a handler that says, 
you know, let's say left in lane. Left in lane is active for 20 milliseconds. That would be your switch handler. That code triggers a whole bunch of other things that you're like, I want to light this light. I want to play this sound. I want to do this, 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 and this. You know, it's event-based. That an event happens in the machine. The, the software knows to be looking for those things. And when it sees that thing happen, it runs your code. So it's much closer to coding a pinball machine similar to how uh, American Pinball, Spooky Pinball, uh, Stern Pinball, and you know everyone in the industry is doing it. It's more close to that. And I wanted to learn code. You know, part of this homebrew project was I wanted to learn the things I did not know how to do, and code was one of them. So I selected Skeleton Game. Um, so let's uh, let's switch over to the uh, computer screen, and we'll throw me in picture in picture, so we get Tiny Benzik, and uh, and a, a whole lot of code. So the first thing about writing code is you need an IDE. An IDE is how you you know uh, how you write the text that gets turned into things that you know ends up being your code. Uh, I personally use PyCharm, um, and what an IDE allows you to do is the the this environment knows the words that are like the specific coding words. So if you put if, or you put else, or and, or you know things like that, the IDE knows that that is like a code specific word and kind of like puts things in for you. So the first thing you need is an IDE, in this case, PyCharm. So I have already built out a game in, uh, in um, PyCharm and Skeleton game. Uh, today we're going to be working on Firepower. Um, I just finished restoring a Firepower, so that seemed like a great game to use. And it's also a simple game that can teach you how to think about how a pinball coder thinks. You know, in Firepower, we have those six targets right at the center of the play field. So today we're going to write a simple mode that handles those targets. But the first thing we have to do is configure the game. So we go in, we get our, you know, skeleton game downloaded. When skeleton game downloads and installs, it has what's called an empty game and it's actually called T2 game and it's a a, a rough uh, a very simplistic version of Terminator 2 and that is what you use as your kind of guide every every guy that has built a homebrew pinball machine that uses skeleton game nine out of the ten of us that do this use t2 game as our base and then we just cut all the things that we don't want to be there out and then put in our stuff now there's some stuff in t2 game that frankly i don't know what it does i cut it out and the machine broke so i just put it back in and one day i'll figure it out and that's one of the fun things about code is you'll be working on something and like hit a block and you know you just can't figure out how to get something to work so you go work on something else and then that something else usually teaches you what you needed to know and you can go back and fix it so we made t2 game i've edited it to firepower so the first thing is like the the configuration this firepower.yaml um you can see here game description for t2 you can see there is some artifacts of the sample game that I just copied over and haven't, you know, deleted. But the first thing we have to do is create all of our switches. So, the, you know, we name them um, and then they have a number. This is the actual hardware address of that switch. So in this case, I have my trough one through three connected to uh, switch direct 44, 45, 46. Pretty simple. We can scroll through the rest of them. They're all there. Um, the next thing is your coils. Your coil, you have your coil name. Like when you want to reference that coil, um, you're going to use this name. If I want to do something the, with the main power coil of my flipper on the left side, uh, I would use this name. And then the hardware address is right here. 
and then the pulse time is right here. What this does, the pulse time is just the basic pulse time. If you tell that coil to pulse, it's going to pulse for 22 milliseconds. Um, other things in here is P, uh, lamps. If we have lighting boards, we have RGB boards. You know, This is where everything gets named that is in the machine. So switches, lights, coils, motors, that's all done here. Once we get that done, we can start writing modes. So when we want to write modes for a pinball machine in skeleton game, there are two ways to think about it. You can either have one mode that handles absolutely everything in the machine. You know, that's more similar to how, you know, like back when we had the Williams three through six, uh, you know, micro microprocessor uh, machines, like the code for those games was all in one place because that's all we could do at that time. I say we like I could code back then, like, like, not a chance. Uh, but that's all that the hardware can handle. So you can write everything in one long file. That works for a while until it just doesn't, because what happens is you have thousands of lines of code in one file that you know could break at any point. And if it breaks somewhere in the middle, you have to figure out why it broke there and what might be you know affecting it. The other way to handle it is by splitting things up. So in skeleton game. When we think about modes, uh, we're treating them as classes. Now, I'm trying to do this as teaching you to code when you've never coded before, and it's really hard. But imagine that the game is a giant circle, and then each of your modes are smaller circles inside. They're all contained in that big first circle, and if they are in the this, each of those smaller circles in the big circle, each of the smaller bits can talk to each other. But because they're smaller, they handle only a very certain task. So in, in this case, we're going to write a mode to handle the six targets of firepower, the, the main six targets. Um, we could handle that in a giant mode, but we're gonna we're gonna break it down so that we know when we're troubleshooting, because like our code's gonna break. Your code's going to break a lot. You're gonna write more bad code than you write good code. Um, eventually that code's gonna break. And so if we're playing our game and then we let's say hit one of those six targets and the game dies, we know we need to look at that single mode because that's probably where it died. You know, we only have one mode handling those targets, you know, one, you know, 500 line block of code, you know, it's only going to be in that 500 lines. It's not going to be like we're looking at a 10,000 line block of code that we're like, oh, yeah, lines 200 to 600 is where we handle those six targets. It's just kind of like a, you know, a, a housekeeping thing. So let's write some modes so the first thing here um we've got base game mode uh this is again this is the starting point of every homebrewers um code you know this base game mode um you know, this is where this runs at the base of the game and handles you know your biggest things anything that's like cross player or you know you just need to be handling in you know, as a very like massive scale happens here. We've got an, another one here called example blank mode. Um, what this is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's a mode that has nothing in it, but it has all the framework that we need for writing a mode. So we're going to, we're going to write, we're going to duplicate this example blank mode and create a new mode. So I'm going to go right here and we are just going to uh, duplicate this.
And so we are going to call this, uh, let's see, um, stand up mode. So now we've got stand up mode here. Uh, how do I get rid of, I'm going to have to pull this down a little bit so I can see. Uh, Let me see. There we go. Awesome. So we've got our stand up mode here. Um, first thing we have to do, we have to rename it. So we're going to go stand up mode. Now notice this says class again. Think of classes as, you know, you've got a bucket and, you know, a class is a bucket. You can have buckets inside of buckets as long as they're smaller. So you know, a coding thing that's complex that I'm trying to make simple. Um, we have we have to rename this to stand up mode. So remember how I said an IDE is going to kind of autocorrect things for you. I started typing stand up and it's like, hey, you want to use stand up mode because you've used that before. Um, so this is how skeleton games works. It's all events. So you know we have this right here. This is called a uh, a method or um, some may call it a function i call it methods uh, i think in python we do call it methods um this def mode started what that is is when when this mode is triggered this block of code here runs so if we said play this sound or trigger this light or you know whatever like when that mode starts, you know, when night mode, when night swim mode starts on Jaws, all the GI turns off. So we could do the same thing here of going, when this mode starts, turn off all the lights. Uh, in this case, you know, we, we think about playing Williams Firepower. We know that when the machine is running, the, the lights, the six stand-up lights are basically, you know, flashing and they're, um, you know, kind of chasing. So in this case, we would probably want to trigger some sort of light show here. Um, I don't have light shows set up yet, so we're not going to trigger it, but that's the sort of way to be thinking about it. Uh, def mode stopped. Same idea. If the mode stops, what do we need to do? This is the sort of thing of like when a mode, you know, when night swim mode ends, we need to turn the GI of the machine back on. Because if we don't, the rest of the game is going to be played with no GI, and we don't want to do that. So let's uh, let's write some switch uh, um, switch handlers. So right here we've got some code. <laughs> And remember what I said earlier about, you know, like the, the target, you know, um, target active um, or active for amount of time. That is how skeleton game triggers uh, events. So in this case, I'm actually going to split this over here. Um, again, an IDE makes this much more simple because we can, you know, see a lot more of what's going on. Um, but we want to write a handler to trigger uh, a switch hit in Firepower. So one of those six stand-ups. First thing we need to know is what's the switch called? So we look over here and our stand-ups are called stand-up one through six. So I am going to go to back to my uh, stand-up mode and we're going to write a switch handler. So this the to trig so we want to trigger some code when stand up one is is active. So we're gonna go def sw stand up one active and then uh, we need it to be self switch. Now, why do we have to put self there? Um, not entirely sure. Now notice as soon as I got as soon as I got this entered, notice how a lot of the colors changed. Um, you know, this turned all yellow, this turned purple. That's the IDE telling you, hey, you wrote the right thing. 
you what you're trying to write is correct. Now, it might not be exactly what you want it to be, but the IDE is saying, whatever you wrote is valid. It might not be the thing you wanted to write, but it's valid. So we have that there. So now we're going to write some code. In this case, um, if standup one is active, we want to score some points. So we're going to go um, self.game.score um, 1,000 points. Now, what does self.game.score mean? Uh, self means, you know, talk, it's referencing the, the game. That it's like, it's basically telling the code, hey, I need to do this. Um, so self is just referencing the, the game. Um, dot game, that is telling the, uh, the framework that this is a game specific operation. There are operations that are game operations. That could be, you know, the, the sound player, uh, the display system, the, the scoring system. Uh, those are all, you know, game item, game operations. Uh, there are things that are, you know, mode operations. We won't talk about those today because those are a little bit too complex. And I can already tell that this, you know, this is like drinking from a fire hose and I need to find a more simple way to present this, but we're working on it. Um, so in this case, we're going to go self.game.score 1000. Uh, after that, oh, that kid's freaked out. Um, and then after that, uh, we want to tell... Uh, we want to tell the game to either stop processing that event or continue to process that event. Why do we need to do this? Well, skeleton game has a priority system. You know, if there might be another mode that I need to use that stand-up target on, just like you know in TNA, the scoop starts uh starts the reactor or finishes the reactor or scores mystery switches can do more than one thing so that means more than one mode is going to be listening or looking at that switch depending on the priority of the mode that um is created the highest priority mode gets the first switch you know event and then we can either tell it hey, keep going, or don't process this switch anymore. So let's say we were in, um, um, like, let's say we wanted to trigger a, uh, we had a, like, mystery enabled on a game, and we shoot the scoop. Well, the scoop is also our multi-ball trigger. Well, we're triggering mystery. We don't want to trigger... The, the multi ball at the same time, so we could say, "Hey, don't process the switch anymore. Um, you know, just keep on running." So in this case, we don't have anything that has to stop us. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to tell it to continue. So we're just going to do return um, proc game dot game dot switch continue. Um, there's a lot there on what that statement is. It's way deeper than we need to go into right now. Um, but that's how we would handle a switch handler. So we're gonna write um, we're gonna write a uh, um, a variable as well. Um, I just have to remember where they the variables are. Um, so in this, we are going to do. Um, so we're going to do S1 equals zero. So what I'm doing up here is I'm going to create some variables that are um, going to help us in the future. Because in this case, we triggered a switch, but we need a way to tell the game hey, we hit that switch. We need to know we hit that switch and remember we hit that switch because we might want to change some lights. You know, like player one hits that switch, it turns on the light. Well, player two didn't hit it. 
if we don't have variables that can control that, you know, that light's just going to stay on forever. And eventually, everyone's going to hit every light on the play field. They're all going to be on, and we're just not going to know what to do in the game. So I'm just going to write some quick variables here. And I'm setting them all to a condition when they start. So this is important for troubleshooting later. That if something breaks, and we're not sure why, we can look at you know how values change in the machine and go, hey, we started all of these at false, and then all of a sudden one of them became true. Okay, we need to find out why that one changed, because it shouldn't have changed. We didn't tell it to change. So um, we're just going to do three for now, and then... Um, we're going to go uh, self dot uh, s1 equals true. So now we basically have a, um, you know, a variable storage that tells us, hey, you know, the first switch was hit. Uh, we're going to copy and paste this. The best part about code is it's mostly copying and pasting. Um, but we're going to change some things. So we need to change that to two. We need to change that to three. We need to change that to three. We need to change that to two. Um, when we do that, um, we can then trigger another event. And that second event, what that can do is, um, you know, do something when we completed the bank. You know, we finish all three targets. That should score some more points, or that should play another sound. Um, we need a way to handle that. So we are going to write another event that is not a switch handler. So we're just going to do def um, bank complete. And uh, we want it to be... Yeah, we're just going to do that. And then uh, we're going to write if uh, s self dot s one um, uh, let's see it's um. Uh, then, you know, um, we'll have it play a sound. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll do if, you know, if S1 is true, then we'll check if this is a really not ideal way to do it, but it's it'll it'll get the job done. Um, let's see, da, 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 da. um, or I'm just trying to find a bit of code that. Oh, yeah, that's what I wanted. Okay. So we're going to rewrite this a little bit because I didn't like how it is. Um, so we're going to go back over here. And we're going to grab some code because, again, everything's copy and paste. You, know, you find something that works, you copy it, you paste it. Um, so we are going to grab... here and we're going to move it over to our stand-up mode because that's going to so 
So basically what this, and we're going to change that to S1. S2. Uh, S3. And we got to clean some of this up right here real quick. Something's upset, but I'm not entirely sure what. Oh, it was just angry that there was some white space. I think there's an extra space there. So basically what this is doing is saying... Um, if this is true, and this is true, and this is true... Um, we're gonna play a sound. Um, so let's make sure we got everything. Um, and we're actually gonna, we're gonna score, you know, a game-breaking amount of, uh, points. All right, so we got that, and then um, and then the else statement pass. So what's going to happen here is um, we're going to take um, switch stand up active. That's going to score us a thousand points. We're going to set the variable to true, and then uh, we are going to run. Um, this uh this method down here what that's going to do is tell the code go down to this bank complete method and check are all three variables true if all three variables are true we want to score some points if they're not don't do anything because the bank isn't complete this would be something that if you're running like drop targets if all three drop targets are down um you know you could shut it all three are down you could reset them. How are we doing on time, Emoto? Where are we at? 5.10. What's that? 5.10? It's 5.10. Oh, I'm already over time? No, it's 5.10. You're, you can keep going till 5.30. Okay, cool. That's your hour. Awesome. Um, doing great. This is, a, there is a lot of information to go through uh, in, you know, this amount of time. Um, it's... It's probably not the best format for, for this sort of information. Um, and I'm probably not the best presenter for it. Cause again, this is coding pinball machines for people that don't know how to code by someone that doesn't know how to code. So, you know, I, all of my learning is me messing it up and making terribly formatted code that somehow works. It's like the Pirates of the Caribbean meme of like, you know, you're the, this is the worst code I've ever seen. Ah, yes, but it does run. So, you know, it's not clean, it's not pretty, but it gets the job done and it'll get my homebrew across the line. Um, so again, we're using this, this bank complete handler that when all of these states are true, do something. If not, don't. Um, in this sort there's a jeffrey the giraffe sorry i got really distracted by that um no literally there is a 10 foot tall jeffrey giraffe behind the godzilla banner oh i can't see him everyone's looking it's somewhere um, over there no one sees it um yeah I'm Hey, Matt, did you ever get tested for ADD as a kid? Oh, um, I see it now. I was too short. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> um, so, like, it, when we're writing, you know, when we're writing this code, if you want it to be really simple, you could literally have the, like, the check, the, the you know, the complete checking done at each one of those, you know, stand up one active, stand up two active, stand up three. You could have it check all of those things at that time. That's a really spaghetti, like not a great way to do it because you're duplicating code so many times and you're taking code that, you know, 
a, a well-written mode might be 500 lines, but if you're triple duplicating code, you're now dealing with, you know, 1500 lines and oh if you get like one syntax thing wrong like uh you know accidentally fat finger a t instead of a u when you're looking at all of that copied over code you get tunnel vision very easily that you know all of the letters start to look the same and you're not going to notice that little change and your error log down here at the bottom is going to tell you, hey, at this line, look at your problem. And you're going to look at that line and go, I don't see a problem. It says stand up to instead of stand up to. Surely that's the same spelling. There's no problems here. But alas, there is a problem there. Um, again, why we use these these bank, these um, you know check cases once that bank is complete, you know, we're going to want to trigger lighting. We're going to want to trigger uh, audio. We're going to want to trigger display elements. Uh, one of the hard things about skeleton game is you have to do the work. Uh, you a, a framework like Mission Pinball framework. It's you're, you're writing config files and everything in the background is being handled. Whereas skeleton game, you have to tell it, all right, I want to score like this is the event I want. This is what I want it to score. I want it to play this sound. Okay, I need to also load that sound in somewhere. You know, it has an asset handler to load that in. You don't have to worry about that, like, memory allocation stuff. But, like, you still have to handle all of those things. Or, oh, I want this animation to pop up. Well, you need to create that animation layer and tell it, you know, is it visible? Does it, you know, have things behind it? All of those things that... I always joke with homebrew, everything you think exists, every step you think exists, 30 exist. Because, you know, we take for granted the UIs that are in these stern machines. Like, I'm looking at, like, the, the Iron Maiden uh, bottom plane. Like, that is a, a graphical layer, and then there's another layer on top of it. Oh, that thing pops up and plays a video? Well, that animation is a rigged animation that's pre-rendered that you have to trigger. You have to light it. You have, like, it's so much to do. That's why every home brewer that's, like, bitten off more than they can chew as far as a technical design side has a two-year, like, I hate us period with their machine because they're just, like, so many things have to be done. And it's like, I'm not an animator, but I'm trying to be. I'm not an artist, but I'm trying to be. I'm not a voice actor, but, you know, all my voice is in the machine. Really funny story about that. I was at the Midwest Gaming Classic. A guy was playing my machine, and I just walked up to check on it. Guy's playing. I'm like, what do you think? And he's like, kind of sucks. You know, there isn't much going on in the machine. There isn't much here. You know, code seems kind of lame. And I'm like, okay, yeah, fair. You know, makes sense. And I walk away. My girlfriend walks, was like 10 steps behind me. Next thing happens, he hits a target that my voice plays, you know, like, you know, Detroit people mover. And he looks at her and goes, that's his voice. Oh, and she's like, yeah, you look like the jerk now. <laughs> but, you know, and it's all in fun. You know, we have to have thick skin anytime you bring something out into the world. But, um. There's a lot that goes into it, and it, it's it's a depressing amount of work at times, but it is a ton of fun. You know, I've learned so much in coding. I know this seminar has felt sporadic, and people that code are looking at how I'm doing things going, why are you writing Python like that? That's not how you're supposed to do it. Jesus Christ, dude. And it's just like, well, it's how I learned it, you know? And, and it works. It's not efficient, but, you know, it gets the job done. Um... Let's uh let's go over to some display stuff because that's fun and you know we got about 15 minutes left. Um, when we talk about homebrew pinball and software for homebrew pinball, the number one problem with it is the displays. Generating graphics is a pain. Doing it efficiently is even worse. Have you if have, have, if you've ever played Total Nuclear Annihilation, you look at the screen, it looks good, right? Do you want to know what resolution that game runs at? 277 by 150. 
Doesn't look like it. Because the art style makes it work. The bet how I know that? I got an asset from this from the game to put in my game, and I opened it up, and it was like that small on a 24 inch monitor. And I just went, hey, did you like compress this? He's like, no, the game runs at that. Look at a TNA from like a foot away. Well, look at the screen and how pixelated it is. Like that's because the only way to get that game to run fast enough on really small, efficient hardware, you have to down res. So like, you know, we take for granted what, you know, Stern, American, JJP, and, you know, uh, Barrels of Fun, and I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, um, but what they can do graphically with the hardware, the SOCs that they're running, uh, we get really spoiled. And that's why like the community is really hard on the home brewers. Cause they're like, it doesn't feel like Iron Maiden. It's like, yeah, I'm not Keith Elwin. Like, sorry. Um, all right, let's talk about displays. Enough, enough freestyling. Um, Configurations. Um, let's see, I think we want uh, store display. Yeah. Actually, we want. Yeah, I think this is. It's been so long since I played with it. Um, so, in in uh, skeleton game, um, there's a lot of stuff for setting up how your, um, oh wait, this is the one I want config. So this is like how the, the game's configured, you know, the, the score displays, how does the bonus work? Do you have a service mode? Do you have ball search? You know, again, the framework is meant to make it easier for you that you get to focus on the fun, sexy code, not the, how do I handle four player? How do I handle variable management between players? Because, you know, again, player one hits target one. Well, when we go to player two, he hasn't hit that target or she hasn't hit that target. That needs to be, you know, stored to a player variable. We're not going to talk about player variables because it took me a while to figure out. And when you're sitting at the MGC with your Voodoo Ranger, you don't, you don't want to be listening to class variables. You just want to know how to make things look cool. Uh, so we've got some default modes, you know, again, you know, does your game have a service mode? Um, and also, you know, what the class of the machine is. In this case, this is uh, basically a fake, uh, a fake script so that I don't have to be using hardware. Um, that's the nice thing about these frameworks. You don't need hardware to do it. You can download skeleton game and just have this not commented out and you can map all the switches two keyboard inputs. If you want to get clever, you can map you could write a MIDI handler and use like a like a Novation launch pad and be able to code a pinball machine and do all of the graphics, everything like that just with like a keyboard or a launch pad and you know that's how I wrote half of my game. You know, I travel for work, so I can't be near my machine all the time. So literally I was streaming while traveling in hotel rooms, writing code for my machine and just testing it out and just, you know, pressing buttons, seeing what worked. Um, it's also really helped with, you know, community development that we have a couple guys that like, uh, my friend Ed Owens, who makes Ghost in the Shell, uh, one of the pinball uh, homebrews over there, um, he had some code that was like really struggling. You know, if I'm not a coder, even more so Ed is not a coder. We're both stuck in the same basket of just not, it's not our language and it's okay. Um, but he had, he struggled on some code. And so he sent it to me like, Hey man, like, do you see anything? And I'm like, Oh, Hey, I think you're trying to use Python as like, you know, an object oriented language instead of what it is. You're trying to make Python run like C and that doesn't work. Let's try this. I sent it over to him. You know, I, you know, finger pressed on my keyboard. And I'm like, I think it worked. Sent it over to him and he's like, hey, it, it kind of worked, but I changed this here. I changed that there and I got it to work. And, you know, we were able to help each other. Um, that's the other thing about homebrew. Um, it takes a village. There's a reason that, you know, I just saw George uh, just walk by. Um, George doesn't code a pinball machine. Keith doesn't code a pinball machine. 
you know, they have teams of software guys. So if you like hardware, build the hardware and find your buddy that likes to write software. Have him do that. You know, you look at a great game like Iron Maiden. That game was a homebrew. It was originally Archer. Keith designed the mechanics. His brother wrote the code. And one of his friends did the art. You know, you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to be an idiot like me or Ed or, well, Kelly managed to knock it out of the park doing it by himself. Same with Doug. Like, there's a couple guys that can do it. You know, none of us are, very few of us are them. Um, but let's go back to displays. So um, displays, we've got some setups here. We can see uh, here our, uh, our, uh, our window is 224 by 112. So a very, a very small screen. Um, you know, when we're doing testing, we don't need that much. Um, my game runs at, I think, you know, I think uh, like 780 by like 1024 or something. So like the lowest HD I could get because um, I wanted, you know, nice assets. Now I have to put a pretty high powered computer in there because that brings me to one of the worst parts of skeleton game. Uh, Skeleton Game is written in Python 2.6. It can't support multi-threading. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to get it ported to 3. Um, and there's also a lot of work, uh, a lot of guys, you know, trying to work on things of getting the display logic out of the game logic. Because if I try to run my game on a small piece of hardware, it doesn't work because the, the video assets lag the game and then the sounds don't play right, the switches don't work. Um, so I have to use like a gaming laptop to make it run. Um, so we've got this config, so that sets up our screen. And then uh, we've got our attract here um, that kind of gives you an idea of how like graphics work in skeleton games. So, um, you know, we have, you know, types of layers uh you know like a text layer of you know how wide the screen is uh where do we want the text justified where what the text is the font how long do we want it to be there um you know and this is all in the attract mode so this is all in like a yaml format which is much easier to deal with i have no idea what wason just said but i'm sure he's making fun of my code um you know he is um this is like a really pared down type of uh, display uh, language for skeleton game. It gets really complex fast because again, you know, you kind of have to just break stuff to get it to work. And I think that's true in MPF. That's true in skeleton game. You figure out a lot of ways to not write code for pinball machines. Um, I think that's about all I can get to without going super in depth and getting really heady really fast. Um, is there any any questions in the chat, or do you have any questions, Amoto? I have a question. Okay. After you do all this coding, what's the next step? How do you get it into a game? So how do I get it into a game? Well, so what I would do um, if I was writing a game. So down here we have a terminal. Um, so if I wanted to start skeleton game, I would do um, So I would run uh, this string, which basically says, "Hey, Python, you need to run fire to power .py, and it's going to load everything up. Um, I don't know if I want to I don't know if I want Python 2.6 seeing public networks because that's a vulnerability um <laughs> no seriously there's a reason python 2.6 isn't used anymore like um it, it's kind of a problem with skeleton game but we're working on it um so like this is what it would look like if it was running on on a machine now if i had this laptop installed in my machine i would have a usb port going out to my uh to my controller whether that be the fast whether that be the um the p3 rock system and then, you know, this would be living in the machine. And then I would have the display YAML say, hey, you need to display on the pinball machines display and, you know, not the computer display. So we can see down here, um, you know, we've got a terminal that's like giving you debug messages. I highly recommend using an IDE. There's guys in the community that just use Notepad. 
um, which does work. You can write this in just a text editor. The problem is your, your error checking is going to be really bad because you're not going to know if you have a simple error. Um, and we basically have a live view down here of everything happening in the machine. So when the, like you see it indexed that it said attract playing next song sound that, you know, that slide of the attract mode had a sound attached with it. And it's, it's telling you a debug message of like, Hey, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm going to go on to the next thing so that, you know, when you're playing the game and you inevitably write some code that breaks something, you can look at this debug min, um, window and go, the last thing that the machine said it did was trigger switch five. Then I'm going to go through my code and find everything that referenced switch five. And, and really the, the debug message will, or the, the, the logging when skeleton crashes, it's usually like you have a reference error or something and it'll say, Hey, I can't reference this, you know, switch or light, whatever. And then you see, you typed it, you know, instead of, you know, dad, you typed sad and you know, it's like, Oh, I hit the wrong key. I type in dad, then it works. Um, I need to record some more videos on skeleton game and like act like send it over to you. Um, I'm basically waiting to like do that once I get, I can get skeleton game into a, a current secure version of Python. Um, you know, there's a lot of games that run this framework. Um, uh, you know, Rick and Morty runs a version of this. Uh, a lot of the early American pinball stuff, uh, ran, uh, a version of skeleton game. Um, uh, TNA ran skeleton game. Um, it's, it's a very robust, it's a very powerful piece of software, but it needs some tuning there. There's some inefficiencies for it being kind of a community led project that, you know, um, that it has. So any, any other questions, Miss Amoto? No, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so I, much for showing that to us. No problem. We'll and, we'll make some better, you know, mid form content that's more organized and, you know, try to try to do some so, something a little bit more organized to make it easier, you know, cuz the the goal of this and you know why I I do these I wanted to do this seminar and, you know, the the homebrew seminar an hour ago was homebrew in 2024 the barrier to entry is so much is the lowest that has ever been in the history of pinball. We have multiple manufacturers of boards that can power your machine. We have multiple software versions. We have multiple communities of makers working together to help each other. Um, we have like industry partners that are paying attention to us. Denise was a home brewer. Elwin was a home brewer. Um, Mark, uh, I can never, um, uh, what, uh, Metroid, why am I blanking on his name? Um, uh, oh. at JJP. Oh. Sedin, Mark Sedin, Sedin. Oh. uh, making, uh, Metroid. He's a home brewer. Jack uh, Danger. Uh, Jack Danger. He was a home brewer. Um, uh, Ryan McQuaid. Ryan McQuaid with Sonic Spinball. He's a home brewer. Those are five guys that now work in as you know major industry people um so you know the industry's paying attention to what we're doing in the homebrew scene if you have an interest it is it is a physical resume and a great way to you know it's a different asset it's a different facet of pinball and you think about how these machines are in a totally different world and it's a lot of fun so Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I can't Yay. wait to make more content for you guys. And, uh, you know, let's make some cool pinball machines. Yeah, let's do it. Thank you so much, Benzik. Thank you, everyone. We're going on a 30-minute break, and then we will be back with Taylor Bancroft from Stern Pinball to give us some awesome Insider Connected updates. Oh, my God. Taylor? I know her! I know. <laughs> so great. I'm so excited for that. So. I just think of the uh, Buddy the L. Santa! I know him! <laughs>
Um, real quick, Benzik, have you played Pin Builder yet on Steam? I have not. You told me I should at Texas. You should. And we were supposed to play with it at Texas, but we got busy doing everything that we do at Texas Pinball Festival that didn't have a time. I did look it up. I think I did download it on Steam. Yeah. I, I really want to check it out because I think that's another thing with, like, the homebrewing community of, like, again, lowering the barrier to entry of VPX is kind of a pain to set up sometimes. It's very daunting still, yeah. you know? And I, for me, like, as a visual person, having Pin Builder now as, like, this simulation where you can build a game and Anna Moore, the creator, is doing all this stuff with the physics. Like, she just added silicone rings to it, and that changes the physics of the game. Um, yeah. But we're going to do a Let's Play together where all of us will get on the stream and then oh, sweet. she'll build the pinball machine. Awesome. But I, I'm excited to see your take on the game because yeah, no, I'm, I'm the definitely, level she's taking it to is I'm definitely insane. down to do something like that. I, yeah. I think that's I think it's really cool. And I, I I love the outreach that, you know, you know. I say you guys at Marco TV, but, you know, clearly I'm helping you guys. I'm, I'm you a part of you guys, you but, uh, you know, what you're doing with Marco TV and, you know, um, you know, giving the spotlight to the people that are doing cool things because that's the sort of stuff that, Hello, you know, Christopher. someone else that's a coder that would want to be involved with that can get in contact with them. And, you know, it's just a different way to enjoy pinball. Yeah, absolutely. So our next big custom game and homebrew thing going on we will be at northwest pinball that's an awesome show doing pin dev con with oh Fast. yeah so it'll be a fun thing to gather more custom games from around the country to present and test what's, their games out in the real world and what's our goal for uh 2025 how many how many custom pinball machines do we want to have at the show circuit are we going to make a goal for ourselves paul already started talking about challenging us to a high number goal yeah. so at texas pinball festival we helped um highlight that you know we got eight games yep. i think there's eight pins there which is really good for a tpf yeah expo usually has a ton of games yeah uh midwest game and classic always has a ton of games northwest is growing too um but i don't know we'll have to talk about it yeah no we we'll, want we'll figure our it out. goal is this big booth size that we're doing with all the new Stern pinball machines. We want to do a booth that big, but with all custom games too. So. All right, that that is a. Your eyes are really big on that one. I love it. Um, let's make it happen. All right, Ben. All right, see you guys later.